if anyone knows anything about her or her whereabouts and her disappearance, if they would please contact us, uh, it's important. Uh, you know, Daniela, uh, when she went missing, she leaves uh, behind right now a, uh, a infant child. And so we would certainly like to reconnect her with her, her infant child. Uh, her mother and, and her, her in-laws are very concerned about, about her and her friends are very concerned about her. And again, as a community, we need to be concerned about her. So if anyone knows anything at all about her, there is a $2,000 reward that the department, is, the department is offering up for anybody that can provide any uh, real assistance that will help, her, help us uh, put an end to her being missing. That was Chief of Police Lawrence Bautiste with the Mobile Police Department in Alabama. Obviously, we have a very concerned community and family and friends of Daniela Vian, all wondering where this young mother is. This week marks six months of her being missing. Is there something that we can do to help? It's time to turn on the searchlight. Hey everyone, John Lorden here. Thank you so much for joining me on another episode of Brain Scratch Searchlight. On top of covering Daniela's case today, uh, please stay tuned to the end of the video for updates on two other cases we've covered recently, Matthew Weaver and Kevin Nugent. We've got very important updates for you guys on those cases as well, but of course, all these cases are important. Let's start with taking a look at a photo of young mother Daniela Vian. And please note in this photo, uh, we've got some tattoos, pretty identifiable tattoos here on her shoulder, uh, a flower that is actually over her shoulder, and then a few small tombstones that are uh, right next to that. Uh, another thing I'm noticing in several pictures I'm seeing of her is different type of uh, piercings on her nose. And I'm seeing them kind of move sides. So I don't know if these were permanent piercings. Um, even in this photo, it kind of looks to me like the left side of her nostril is pierced as well. But let's go ahead and get to the name is profile and see what the official information is on Daniela's case. We can see missing person Daniela Nicole Vian, a white Caucasian female. Date of last contact was July 17th, 2018. Missing from Mobile, Alabama at the age of 25 years old. Uh, for case information, let's see, her height is between five foot four to five foot six inches tall. She weighs about 110 to 120 pounds. And uh, for circumstances, on July 17th, 2018, Daniela Nicole Vian left her residence and has not returned. She was last seen wearing a dark colored mellow mushroom shirt, black leggings, a light colored hat, and had a light colored shirt tied around her waist. She may be traveling in a 2014 deep blue slash purplish Chevrolet Cruze with a Pearl Motors white and green paper tag. As a matter of fact, uh, that's one of the more interesting aspects of today's case is she literally got that car earlier that day. Uh, she had saved up a bunch of money, finally had her down payment, and went and picked up that car earlier that day. So uh, could that be a part of what's going on with, with her being missing? Might it be that someone wanted that vehicle, wanted to steal it from her? Could it be that uh, she was unfamiliar with the car and that led to her missing in some way? I think that there's, there's some factors we need to consider there. Uh, for her hair color, they have it listed as brown. For her eyes, they also have them listed as brown. Tattoos has an elephant tattooed on her wrist and a flower and headstone near her shoulder. Obviously, we just talked about those. And here we can see uh, a close-up on the elephant tattoo that's on her wrist as well. Outside of that, for clothing and accessories, once again, they're just mentioning the dark colored mellow mushroom shirt. Uh, I guess that's a pizza place. I'm not familiar with it, but we'll see the logo a little bit later on today's video. Uh, for the light colored hat, I've seen a different description. I believe it's actually a pink hat. Uh, black legging style pants with a light colored shirt tied around her waist. For transportation, obviously, they're still noting the 2014 Chevrolet Cruze, uh, which I believe the, the official color is actually Atlantic blue, and that vehicle is still missing. Now, what's tricky about that is because it was so new, 
there is no license plate number on it. Um, it's not registered in any state yet. She literally picked it up that same day. So uh, what we're really looking for is a Chevrolet Cruze of that color that happens to be in an area where this might make sense as being related to uh, Daniela's case. Uh, but that's it. And as you can see here, they don't even really have the piercings described. That's why I wanted to be sure to point out in several of the photos I've seen of her, at least uh, a, a nose piercing. It does seem to move from side to side. So I'm also wondering if it if maybe it's not an actual piercing, but she's just using jewelry there. Uh, I can't be 100% sure. Now things get interesting with this case very quickly. Just moving on to the first article we're going to cover at WKRG.com. Mobile police confirmed to News 5 that the investigation into Daniela Vian's disappearance has been turned over to the homicide unit. However, police say there's no evidence at this time that a homicide occurred. That is very strange. And I can tell you, I've been keeping an eye on this case for a couple months now, and I was kind of flip-flopping if I should cover this on Brain Scratch because of this development and because of some of the other developments we're going to see here, or if this is really a searchlight case. Are we looking at an unsolved homicide, or are we looking at just a straight-up missing persons case? Obviously, you're seeing this on Searchlight, so uh, it took some time for some of the developments to shake out, but I feel confident that um, there are several different outcomes possible with this case, and not all of them have to do with an unsolved homicide. However, this is really strange. I talk to families all the time that are wondering why in my loved one's missing persons case can't I get a, homi a homicide investigation to happen with it? And here... We have precisely that happening, even though the police are basically telling us they don't have any evidence that there is any foul play involved here. So very strange development. Really don't see this happen very often. But as I note on this channel all the time, we have thousands of police departments and they seem to operate in very different ways from one place to the next. Uh, let's continue with the article here. News 5 spoke to her mother-in-law, Julie Dykes Thomas, who says she reported Vianne missing Friday morning. She tells us she last saw her Tuesday morning when she dropped her off to buy a new car. Now, I don't, from the information I'm reviewing, I don't believe that uh, Daniela was actually married to the father of her child. However, Julie Dykes Thomas is the father's mother, and they were very close. Um, Cora is the name of Daniela's child. Cora actually lives with Julie. As we can see, even from this example, obviously these are people that are very close. Julie actually gave Daniela a ride to go get her new car. From some other information we're going to review here soon, you're going to find out that um, Daniela was over there frequently because she was spending time with Cora and she had plans to even spend more time with Cora. Um, so let's continue here. Thomas says Vian may have called out of work Tuesday night to celebrate the car purchase with friends. She may have spent the night at Dublin Pub on Old Shell Road. A friend said she was last seen wearing a mellow mushroom t-shirt since she used to work there. So uh, I've actually looked at this mellow mushroom. There's a few different logos, um, but they seem to have the same kind of feel. Let's just run through a few of them here. And I believe it's actually a black t-shirt that has this mellow mushroom logo on it. I'm not sure if it's this one or if it's more like the first one that we saw. Uh, they've even got this other one where the mushroom is dunking. Um, so, but it's, it's probably something along these lines. I really wish that we had a better description or maybe even a photo of the actual shirt, but I have not been able to find anything like that. Continuing over at AL.com, Vianne, who was originally from New Mexico and was part of a military family, was having drinks with friends the evening she was last seen. She has a four-year-old child who is now in the care of a relative, obviously, uh, that is referring to um, Julie, the mother of Cora's father. Cora lives with her grandmother, Julie, who is the mother of Daniela's boyfriend, Tyler Thomas. Julie told Dateline that while her granddaughter has lived with her since she was born, Tyler and Daniela have always been a big part of Cora's life. Julie says she last saw Daniela driving away from the dealership in her new car, a 2014 deep blue Chevy Cruze with a Pearl Motors temporary license plate on it. Julie would later learn that to celebrate the purchase, Daniela went out that night to a bar where her friend Randy Caps was bartending. Through conversations with Randy, Julie later learned that while Daniela was there, she was joined at the bar by a woman and a man named Denson White. 
Denson White is kind of an important figure in the rest of the story, so keep him in mind. Julie says Daniela was not close friends with the couple. The three of them decided to go to a different bar while they waited for Daniela's friend Randy to finish his shift. Randy said he texted the group later that he had finished his shift and asked them to meet at a third bar. I believe that place, if I'm getting all this right, I believe that place is actually a restaurant called Ollie's Mediterranean. Uh, in separate cars, Daniela, White, and the other woman each drove to the third bar, but um, Daniela doesn't get there. And let's continue at another article from WKRG.com. The mother of a missing mobile woman says she fears the worst, but she's hoping for the best. Daniela is a strong, independent woman. If anyone can find their way home, she will, said Joy Vian. I'm sick to my stomach. I'm going through every emotion possible from bawling my eyes out to anger to being in shock. Friends say the 25-year-old spent a good portion of her night at Dublin's pub off Old Shell Road after purchasing a car. That car, a dark blue 2014 Chevy Cruze, hasn't been located. And keep in mind, I, I've seen some pictures of it, and it does look like it has almost a purplish tint to it. So some people might see it and say it's actually purple. Um, I'm sure, depending on the lighting that you see it in, that that could probably uh, kind of tilt the color one direction or another for certain people as well. Over at fox10tv.com, some more information. Family members say Vianne went to the Dublin pub and eatery. She left there with a friend in separate cars to go to another establishment and along the way, flashed her lights when she realized she didn't have her cell phone. Family members say she pulled over with her friend at a shell station on government near I-65 to look for the phone, couldn't find it, then decided to go back to Dublin's to search for it. Family members say the friend said Vianne got in her car and that was the last he saw of her. And of course, that friend that they're mentioning is once again, Denson White. So here's a map so we can take a look at this. And I wanted to show this to you guys because there's already aspects of this story that aren't really making sense to me logically. And this is one of the big ones. We have the Dublin pub and eatery here. Uh, we have the Shell station that they supposedly stopped at when she realized she didn't have her phone way down here. Now, the interesting thing is supposedly they were meeting up at this place called Ollie's, which is over here. So if we look at this path of travel, considering that they were supposedly going from the Dublin straight to Ollie's, this really doesn't make sense. We've got miles and miles additionally being added onto this trip when... Logically, you would just leave the Dublin, you would take Old Shell Road to Hillcrest, make a left on Hillcrest, and then just do a straight shot right to Ollie's. So there seems to be some other aspect of this story that I just don't know that we fully understand at this point. This trip out in this direction isn't really making a lot of sense to me for them supposedly just going to this other bar to, to continue their evening out. So kind of bothered by it. And that's why I wanted to share that with you guys. So let's continue at mynbc15.com with some information. Now, of course, if they were at a shell station, uh, you know, when I'm looking into these cases and I hear something like that, I'm always like, okay, great. Gas stations are really good about having surveillance. It's just a matter of do, do the police get there in time to actually get the surveillance tape before it gets erased or overwritten. Here at mynbc15.com, we learn surveillance video may show missing mobile mother. However, as a matter of fact, this video apparently at one time was posted. I saw a screenshot of it. It's not worth showing you guys because it's really junky and the, the video quality doesn't look great at all. Um, but NBC 15 has removed the surveillance video at the request of Mobile Police. So they actually did have it. I do believe they broadcast it for a period of time. The police asked them not to do that and they basically stopped. Surveillance video obtained by NBC 15 News shows what could possibly be the last time missing Mobile mother Daniela Vian was seen. The timestamp video shows what appears to be two cars pulling into the parking lot at 11.05 p.m. on July 17th. Now, with the story we've already been told, this makes some sense. I'm still questioning why they're basically in the opposite direction of where they were supposed to be going, but it at least makes some logical sense in terms of the story. She realizes she doesn't have her phone. She blinks her light to flash down the other car. They stop at this gas station together. Two minutes later, one car appears to leave. The other car stays. At 11.08, another car pulls in and both cars stay parked until 1124 
when they both leave. Now, I've looked into some other stuff. I've been reading up Web Sleuth's thread on this, listening to interviews uh, with Julie Thomas as well. I believe it's fairly clear that the car that stayed behind is Daniela's car. Uh, and in a video segment that was produced by my NBC 15, they also said they're very confident that the footage shows her leaving in her car on her own at the end of this. Uh, however, we do know that both cars leave at the same time. So I feel like we're missing part of the story in terms of what's going on here. I, I can tell you I have found no information to support any type of drug use. As a matter of fact, I've heard some friends and family members say quite the opposite about Daniela. I don't know that it's necessarily a drug pickup, but there is some meeting I think that's going on here that has not been exposed to the public through media and maybe even the, the close friends and family don't know about. Just the logistics of this do not make sense. Um, two cars stopping at a gas station, yeah, sure, no problem with that. But then one car leaving while the other car stays and only a few minutes later, another car pulls up, parks right next to that first car. They stay there for a number of minutes, you know, 15 minutes, and then they both leave together. It just, it really seems to me that there was some type of meetup going on here, that they were going somewhere else other than the story we're being told. I don't think Ollie's was necessarily the end game. Now, What's also interesting about this is Denson White, who actually went to help file the police report with Julie Thomas when Julie was going to actually file the missing persons report. Uh, the story, at least that I'm hearing that's coming from Denson, has some slight changes happening into it, including when Julie actually asked him, why were you guys off in that direction over by the Shell station if you were planning on going to Ollie's? It, it kind of doesn't make sense. Denson says, oh, I didn't know the plan was to go to Ollie's. I was actually uh, heading home. So we're getting these weird little changes in the story that I don't quite understand. And then on top of that, after the fact, Denson actually goes back to Dublin's and gets her phone and then uses her phone to contact Julie and ask, you know, where should I drop this off? I've, I've got her phone. I see that, you know, there's pictures of her baby on here. You know, what should I do with this? Julie tells him, take it to where she works, which is currently at PF Chang's and drop it off there. So it's just kind of strange to me. Um, even if he did think that they were going back to Dublin's, which I don't know why she's got her own car and he says he was heading home. He should have just gone home straight from there. But let's say he's being a nice guy. He wants to make sure she doesn't get in, in any trouble, doesn't do a very good job because he's basically escorting her back there, but doesn't realize that her car never even left the parking lot. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Then he gets there. He doesn't wait for her to show up. And then if she doesn't show up, you know, maybe go back to the shell station, take the same route, see if something happened. You know, I, 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 obviously it's a secondhand car if she bought it in 2018 and it's a 2014. Maybe there's some mechanical problem or something like that. There's just, there's so much logic that isn't holding together for me in terms of this story and the intent of these people and their actual actions. And then he goes and he gets the phone. And we know he at least reviewed the phone enough to notice that there was pictures of the baby on it. I don't know if he had the code to actually unlock the phone. I know Julie does get the code to unlock the phone later, but I don't know that Denson had that. Maybe it was just the lock screen that had the picture of Cora on it. Um, I'm not sure, but it's still strange to me that he's expecting her to be following him. She doesn't, but he goes in and takes her phone. Why? And according to the information we have, this is not someone that they were close friends. You know, this, this is kind of someone that they either knew casually or had just met. So why is he taking her personal property? I don't know. The friend told family members he last saw Vianne get in her car to follow him back to the bar and assumed she was driving behind him. The search for Danielle Vian is not a homicide investigation. It is a missing persons case assigned to homicide detectives. MPD tells us the homicide department have a lower caseload than the actual missing persons division. So homicide investigators currently have the case. I have never heard of that before. In the hundreds of cases I've reviewed, I have never, ever heard that, yeah, homicide's going to pick this one up because, yeah, their workload isn't too heavy right now. Um, I don't know if I buy that. I, I almost feel like 
uh, police are putting information out into the public through the media um, and they're trying to maybe not rattle people about where the investigation is really headed or something along those lines. I just, uh, I don't know. It could absolutely be true, maybe, because I'm telling you, these these police departments operate in very, very different ways. So uh, perhaps it is 100% true. I'm just telling you guys, I've never seen anything like that before. Continuing at WKRG.com, we have another article with a pretty interesting picture. This is a picture of da Daniela Vian's journal, one page from her journal, and it's talking about goals that she has. Uh, she, you can see she's got personal goals, things she'd like to do, and all of this is basically what is the next step after getting a car. And she talks about putting money towards a Capital One car, card. Uh, she talks about getting Cora's bedroom completely put together. From what I understand, Danielle lived on her own in an apartment. So I don't know if there was an extra room that she was going to make into Cora's bedroom, something along those lines. Uh, she wants to start school. She's got library fees she needs to pay. Uh, she wants to take Cora to school every day, make sure that Cora is attending a sport or dance class of some kind, uh, and have Cora sleeping over 80% of the time. And the last note on there is to be more positive. So we can see this is a young person trying to figure out their life, trying to get things in order for themselves. Uh, and that's kind of part of the tragedy is something has stopped her. None of these goals are, are moving forward right now with what's happening here. And that's why, um, that's why I want to share this with you guys. And hopefully you'll share it with others that you know in the Mobile area as well. And we can keep some exposure rays to this case. Uh, another interesting point, and these photos kind of highlight it, is you can see um, she colors her hair as well. And I've seen some descriptions actually say that her hair is red. Um, obviously, the NamUs profile said that her hair is brown, but just keep in mind that her hair could be colored uh, also. Here's an article from August 2nd, 2018. Police are offer offering a $2,000 reward for information related to the whereabouts of a mobile mother who has been missing now for more than two weeks. MPD Chief Lawrence Bautiste said MPD investigators have exhausted almost all of their leads and are looking to the community for any information that could lead to Vianne's safe return. We've entered all of Daniela's information into all of the national databases that we can, and at this point we're trying to keep the community engaged. While little information has been released by MPD, Bautiste did say Thursday that Vianne does not have a history of running away or leaving town without notifying anyone. Her family has also said they didn't notice any strange behavior leading up to Vianne's disappearance. Continuing with yet another article at WKRG, who I want to thank for covering this case as well as they are. This article is from August 24th, 2018. A car wash fundraiser is in the works to help raise money for the Daniela Vian search effort. The fundraiser was scheduled for Sunday, September 2nd at Hurricane Grill and Wings. This hits especially close to home for us as Daniela is a former employee and we desperately want to help in the efforts to bring her home, the restaurant wrote on the event page on Facebook. Uh, I just always like sharing these aspects of this story where the community is rallying around these causes. And I think it's really cool that businesses step up and do something like this. The restaurant also says it plans to donate 15% of all sales between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. on the day of the fundraiser to Daniela's family. Uh, continuing at fox10tv.com, uh, Julie Thomas, the mother-in-law, well, She's referred to as a mother-in-law, like I said. I'm, I'm not positive there's an actual marriage there. Uh, but here's a quote from her. Just not knowing every day is really hard, and not being able to have any answers for Cora is hard. Uh, Julie has also run through a number of theories of where Daniela could be, but Daniela leaving on her own isn't one of them. She had her goals, very strong-willed. She worked hard to save the money to get her car. She left cash in her apartment. You don't just do that if you're going to leave, Thomas said. I think she's making a very good point. Uh, Daniela was last seen at the Shell gas station. According to police, she was captured on surveillance video leaving. But when she, where she went next is still a mystery. Homicide is looking into that. They say they may have some more footage of her, but they're not ready to let that out, Thomas said. 
Uh, I was wondering about that. I, you know, just looking at the area of where the Shell station is, it's a bit of an industrial area, but it seems to me there's a lot of other businesses that could have cameras there. And I'm wondering if police tried to stitch together uh, some of her movement by possibly looking for cameras that might have picked up the roads that she was traveling on. Uh, and maybe they were able to. We're getting a little hint that there might be some other video in this case, but uh, obviously it hasn't been released publicly. And it seems like the family even has kind of limited information on what that video might be. Now, what happened with the fundraiser, once again, just amazes me to see um, communities pulled together like this. An update on Sunday, September 2nd, Car wash donations alone reached a total of $2,356.27. And that amount is before Hurricane Grill and Wings donated a portion of their sales. Uh, just amazing that people help each other out like this. And someone else I wanted to point out as an amazing person over at this article at fox10tv.com is this young man that you see right here in the video window. One of the people volunteering in the search effort is a nine-year-old and his mom who have never met Vianne. They say it all started because of a Facebook post asking if anyone had a drone searchers could use. Aiden Logan and his mom Liz had one, and now a month later they are helping in the effort, passing out flyers, and participating in fundraisers. He's constantly talking about her, he wears her t-shirt, he wants her home, and so I'm going to support him, said Liz Logan, Aiden's mom. I want to help get answers for her daughter because if that was my mom, I would be really sad and I would try to find her, Aiden said. Aiden is putting up flyers, so far about 500, and he has a goal of 20,000. Uh, I can't believe that we've got a nine-year-old trying to help on this case in this way, and it just moves me. Um, I wish I was doing that kind of stuff when I was nine. So Aiden, you've, you've got a big fan here. Another article at Fox 10 News uh, from September 13th, 2018. And this is where the story takes a really bizarre turn. Uh, mobile police searched a property in Theodore connected to the disappearance of missing mobile woman, Daniela Vian. Investigators did not say what that connection is, but police said they did not find Vian. Jason Dykes was booked on charges of domestic violence strangulation, domestic violence assault, and unlawful imprisonment. We've got a picture of Jason here. Mobile police subsequently told media that a criminal investigation was underway, a search warrant was executed, three people had been detained, a SWAT team was involved in the operation, no shots were fired, and no one was injured. Just before noon, police told Fox 10 News it would be an all-day investigation on the property. Numerous law enforcement assets and resources were being used, including canine units and drones. People carrying shovels were observed moving across the property. Uh, obviously, this is the news that I saw when I was looking into this case and thinking I wasn't sure if I was going to cover this on Searchlight or Brain Scratch. Uh, when you see that kind of movement and people are mentioning it's related to a case like this, uh, we don't see very good things come out of that. But what happened here? Let's continue with another article. Court records have revealed disturbing allegations against a man police in Mobile recently arrested for allegedly imprisoning a woman in his home for more than three weeks. The Mobile Police Department initially indicated the search of Dykes' property could be connected to its investigation into the disappearance of 25-year-old Daniela Vian. It was later revealed that Dykes was related to Vian's ex-boyfriend, and family members told Fox 10 reports that she had been to the property in the past. However, police found no evidence connected to Vian's case, and Dykes is not considered a suspect at this point. Instead, the charges against Dykes stem from the alleged treatment of another woman who says he raped, beat, and held her against her will for weeks after she moved in with him, Dykes pleaded not guilty to those charges Tuesday in Mobile County District Court. So just a really strange twist for having a, a police department that seems so tight-lipped to having this big operation happen at this guy's house and then people actually being quoted there as saying, you know, this is related to the Daniela Vian case. Uh, it's just, it really threw me for a loop. And then to see this outcome that, Basically, it doesn't seem like it's all that related. Yeah, Daniela might have known the guy, was at the property before, uh, he's related to her ex-boyfriend, but there doesn't really seem to be other any other connection. Um, 
once again, I'm just seeing things in this case that I have not seen before after you know doing this type of work for years. It's uh, certainly keeping me on my toes today. Let's continue with another article at mynbc15.com. This one from December 17th, 2018. Monday marks five months since a mobile mother vanished in the middle of the night. A vigil was held for Daniela in October. Her daughter celebrated her fifth birthday without her mother on Sunday. Mobile police have created a blog for people to post any information they may have on her disappearance, and they have also increased the reward to $5,000. Uh, here is mobilepd.org forward slash blog, and you can see it is specifically about Daniela Vian. There's only three posts here, but what's really interesting about this is if you click into this first article here for help bring Daniela home, there are over 5,700 comments from people just in that one article. Um, and that's another interesting thing about this case is the social media layer of this case is just exploding. I think Web Sleuths has five or six different threads on this and each of those run, uh, typically they run about 50 pages before they close the thread out and open a new one. I'll have links to all those down below. Um, but even talking about this, 5,700 comments for one blog post. Um, people are obviously very, very concerned with this case on the social media layer. And I think Julie is actually doing a good job. I've heard her interviewed in several places. Um, she also seems to be kind of acting as their own investigator, trying to figure this out for herself. Uh, Julie, I think you're doing an amazing job. If there's anything that you think I can help with, if you want to help, uh, us understand this case better by coming on the channel here, whatever it is, please reach out to me, John, J-O-H-N, at Lord and Arts, just like it's spelled in the channel name, dot com, and we will certainly work to help you with this case as well. I know you're working very hard, uh, and I do applaud your efforts. I think you've done an amazing job with raising exposure here. Now, I have heard that there is an official Facebook page, and I've heard there are a few unofficial Facebook pages. I believe this is the official one, Bring Missing Daniela Home. So I'm gonna have this in the description box below so you guys can check that out for yourself as well. Um, there is this other one that is called Missing Daniela Vian, but it's a closed group, and I'm not sure if this is the official one that's actually uh, tied with the family. So I'll have it down below just in case. Uh, I'm really just about sharing as much good information as we can, but I have seen some comments that Julie has made about some of these groups and she doesn't really um, trust some of the information that is going around. You know, She's really trying to stray away from rumors and really trying to deal with facts, which I think is an amazing approach and very tough typically for anyone this close to the case to actually uh, be able to do. So I'm glad she's focused on that. Um, and I don't want to muddy the waters, but I just, I'm trying to share with you guys all the, the information that I think might help you with a better understanding of that. Of course, that includes the web sleuth threads that I will have in the description box below. And finally, they are also doing a fundraiser here. Uh, you can see this fundraiser has actually been started by Julie Dykes Thomas, and it's just talking about um, helping them with expenses and helping them possibly raise the reward even higher. So on behalf of myself and my amazing supporters through PayPal and Patreon, thank all of you so much. We are going to be making a donation to this GoFundMe just as soon as I'm done filming this episode. So what's going on with this case, Brain Scratchers? Um, the, the story feels wrong to me. The, the trip to the Shell station doesn't make sense. Uh, the fact that we have somewhat minor, but we do have inconsistencies happening with the story that the last person that was with her is telling bothers me. Um, the fact that that person went back and grabbed her phone kind of bothers me. I don't know. There's, there's some, I feel like there's a big part of this story that we just don't have right. And what we have outside of that is not only a person missing, but I get really concerned when a car is missing. And there's a whole other aspect to this. Essentially, because she was financing this vehicle, it had its own GPS tracking device. Now, from what I understand, I see some people refer to it as a low jack. I don't think it was actually a low jack because low jacks are typically hidden in the vehicle. Uh, I think this was a more easily accessible device. The strange thing is, once the car gets to that shell station, the device 
loses connectivity. They have no more pings. They can see before that, they can see that she was indeed at Dublin's and that she went from there to the Shell station. But after that, the GPS device doesn't work any longer. Why is that? Obviously, possibly there could be a coverage issue. It'd be a little strange to me if it did actually map the trip from Dublin's to the Shell station, then why would it stop after the Shell station? Doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. Or it could have been a device that was actually removed from the vehicle. And according to information that Julie has gotten, uh, it's not completely out of the realm of possibility that that happened. It's a device that would essentially be accessible from the inside of the car. So it could be that the device was removed for some reason, but why? Once again, just pointing us in this direction of really not understanding this. And we have a mother missing, but when she's missing with her vehicle, it really bothers me. Of course, we've had cases like this before uh, where a vehicle has been found in a body of water. I've looked at the map uh, for the path that she was driving, at least going from Dublin's to that Shell station. There is what is called, I think it's called Dog River, if I remember. Um, but I took some, some looks at it from the Google Street View, and it doesn't look like it's very big. I'm pretty sure if the vehicle was in that river that it would have been spotted. So I don't think that's feasible. But are there any bodies of water after that that are within driving distance? Uh, possibly. So... Um, you know, if I was an investigator on this case, I would be wondering about those bodies of water. It's just, it's so hard. How do you hide an entire vehicle? It's really, um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a challenge in itself. And what I'm really worried about here is we know that she was celebrating getting her new car. We know that she spent an extended amount of time at a bar. Uh, it seems like she was drinking. I'm not hearing that she wasn't a drinker. So is there some possibility of some type of accident that happened here? A vehicle she's unfamiliar with, she's only had it not even a whole day yet, and maybe she could be maybe not even drunk, but maybe just uh, a little bit intoxicated. Could that have made the difference of her not realizing what she was doing with some aspect of the car, her foot going on the accelerator instead of the brake, uh, knocking the shifter into a different gear, something along those lines. Uh, I'm really concerned about some angle on that too. So, but what do you guys think? Let's talk about it in the comments down below. And of course, as usual, I'm going to ask that we please remain respectful. There's a very good chance. I'm pretty sure that Julie's going to find it. Um, but even outside of that, that other family members, maybe even someday a, a young daughter named Cora could come across this thread. So let's please be respectful in the comments. All right, I told you guys I got a couple updates for you. Let's do this. Matthew Weaver. Now, this is a GoFundMe that we actually donated to. And because of that, I get regular updates anytime they're posted to it. They sent an update out this week that I think is kind of brilliant and I wanted to share with all of you. Um, they had drones take aerial footage uh, or, or snap aerial photos of the entire site. And they now have something like I believe it's like 760 photos. And they're basically trying to crowdsource um, the review of those photos. So I'll have a link to it down below. If you guys want, you can come to this website. You can pick a photo. You can look through the photo. They're offering a $50,000 reward for anyone that can find Matthew in one of these photos. They've also got another way to review it, which is a Google Maps. Um, I think it's Google Earth, actually a download package where you can download, it's it's huge of course, because these are um, high quality photos, but you can download a whole package, add it to Google Earth, and then you can scan the area like that. But um, they're looking for all the help they can get. I wanted to share that with you guys. So if you have some free time and some interest, please check out those links below. And I just think it's a brilliant way to try to find an answer in this case. If Matthew is really out there, if that drone was able to get a good shot of the area where he is, there's a pretty good chance that their answer is somewhere in these photos. And maybe you can be the person to help them find that. Moving on to the case we covered last week, Kevin Nugent. First of all, here is the NamUs profile that I put together and is now available. It has been approved, fully available, uh, so people can check it out for themselves. I was fortunate enough to get connected with Elena Rasnick, who is the family friend 
that is helping with this investigation. And she called me with Lance Yankee, Kevin's father, actually there. So I was able to ask them some questions that I had. I know several of you had questions also, just a little bit more about what type of person Kevin was, uh, what was going on with this bar. Uh, let me tell you guys, based off you just asking about the bar, I started looking into it a little bit more online. Um, it's just kind of a dive bar that has music acts that come through there. But if you look at the Google reviews in particular for the Brass Rail, you'll find out that some people really have bad experiences there. And I'm not just talking about a bartender that doesn't want to make a certain drink for you. Several people noted being roughed up at that bar. Um, so I'm kind of curious if there's some aspect of that that could relate to what happened to Kevin. But uh, for the information that I got from the phone call, uh, first of all, Kevin was doing classes online. He was really interested in animation. That's what he was working towards. Uh, outside of Leanne, uh, the sister, he does also have an older brother. They also wanted to clarify, I know on the episode I talked about that one of the news reports said he had a gauge only in one ear. Uh, Elena was very clear he had gauges in both ears and that he just went to the bar that night specifically to hang out and to listen to some live music. Uh, Leanne actually dropped him off at the bar that night. I asked about the confrontation, what happened in the bar that supposedly got him kicked out? And they said, according to what the staff said, that he was harassing girls, but the family has been asking and they have not found anyone that supports that story. Uh, I've also heard that there was no official bouncer. There was just a guy that works at the door that's basically checking IDs. Um, and I also asked about the possibility, would Kevin have run away? Was, was there, did he do that in the past? Anything like that? They said, no, absolutely not. And if he was going to run away, why would he have called home and asked for a ride? Which obviously makes a lot of sense. Uh, on top of that, they said he had no enemies. He was just a very shy kid, kind of kept to himself quite a bit. I also asked about the walk. It was about four miles from the bar to his home. Would he have walked that? They said, no, absolutely not. He wouldn't have walked. And once again, he called for a ride. So some interesting things that they told me about um, in terms of the owner of the bar. It's kind of strange to me that they could go to a company like Arby's and get footage from them of Kevin, but the family could not get footage from the bar. And I think the bar is privately owned. Typically, I see the reverse on that. Typically, the bigger companies, it's a bit harder to get the footage because they have corporate policies that stop that. And the smaller companies that are, you know, single owner companies, it's usually easier to get the footage. But we have the flip flop happening here in that case. Um, and I, I can tell you they were a bit leery about um, the owner's possible involvement. Apparently, he lives very close to the area. Um, you know, this is really kind of hitting the rumor mill stuff, so I don't want to go into it too much, but I can just say that a consideration for them is that the owner is not being very forthcoming with the video because something else is at play here, which I think is, is something that's itching in the back of all of our minds if you've looked into this case at all. So, but on top of that, they shared with me, uh, several links that I want to share with you. The first of them is the official Facebook group which I will have in the description box below so you can check that out. Help bring Kevin Nugent home. Uh, on top of that, there is a podcast that has started. I played a little bit of an interview with Lance for you on the last episode. Apparently the DJ that did that interview is kind of running with it and he's now starting a podcast specifically dedicated to this case. So I'll have a link to that down below as well. And they have also put together a GoFundMe and why not? Uh, let's make it all three of the GoFund we've, we, we've mentioned on this episode. Once again, on behalf of you, my amazing Patreon and PayPal supporters, we're going to donate to Kevin's GoFundMe as well. That's it for today's Searchlight. Thank you so much for hanging with me to the end. I really appreciate you guys being there. Please remember to share these videos. It really helps get that exposure raised. We're trying to get this information in front of the people that maybe have a little nugget that they haven't shared yet. And maybe we can nudge them to share that with the right people that can act on it and help in these cases. So I need you guys to help with that. Thank you so much. Take care and I'll see you back here on Friday with a brand new episode of Brain Scratch on the Lord and Arts channel.